we're, we're going to go for it either way. Um, all right. Fantastic. Uh, hey, that's the Discord channel. There you go. Uh, FP, yes, brings back the Neta Talk memories. We shouldn't talk about that. All right. So this is my beautiful keynote theme that comes with it. It changes color. It's not you. It's the actual theme. Um, <laughs> So if, if you're at home and wondering why the color seems to be changing in the background, that's intentional. Um, all right, so uh, we're here to talk about rapidly developing proof of concepts, which is a lot of what I do now. Uh, I've got a team at Jump Cloud where we kind of chase butterflies and kind of look at fun stuff and kind of investigate tech. Um, our mandate is not to ship to production, which may come apparent as I go through this session. <laughs> all right, so I'll just let you know that that uh, just because it worked for me for a proof of concept does not mean you should ship a product based upon this, but, but maybe. Uh, there's maybe no reason not to. Uh, but how you can kind of mix uh, local development, cloud pieces, and all the rest together and have a lot of fun doing it. Um, disclaimer, bold text, uh, maybe not for use in production. Your problems require your solutions. I have no idea what you're doing. Uh, so what I say may or may not be relevant. Um, your cloud provider may be different. Don't trust me. My degree is in journalism, which is true, which is true. All right. So, um, but it's worked for me. All right. So obligatory Swift is really cool. Um, Swift is better than snakes. So don't use Python. Uh, woo. However, for this talk, I am making an allowance that gophers do come in between snakes and birds. And I think in the predator apex, that works, right? Maybe? All right, so Go is growing on me. Uh, starting to like it quite a bit. It's kind of like Swift if you squint a little bit. Uh, so if you're pretty good at one or the other, you'll probably be OK at the other one. Um, and uh, Python's probably fine for doing things. So if, if you already use Python, don't like change your whole world because of it. Uh, maybe feel bad slightly, but then move on. Um, all right. so. June 3rd, we roll the calendar back like two or three weeks. I'm thinking, man, it's going to be fantastic. I'm going to go to Vancouver. It's going to be sunny. It's going to be like 75, 80 degrees. The weather's going to be great. We're going to see people in person again. It's going to be wonderful. Matt's going to get me waffles. Um, and I was going to do a session, which I thought was going to be pretty cool, on running Windows MDM on your Mac. Uh, probably about three months ago, started doing a lot of dev on what Windows MDM is like. Um, started writing it in Go, put it all in VS Code on the Mac, and then hosting it through some of the things that I've been giving you. And I thought it'd be kind of a fun thing to actually run Windows MDM at Mac DevOps. I thought that was kind of cool, ironic. Um, so I was all ready to do that, had the whole talk written, uh, all the slides were done, it was amazing, they were gorgeous. Um, and then June 5th rolls around as is normal with Mac DevOps. Uh, Apple has a thing, and that thing happens, and then you're like, well, hell. Um, <laughs> we should maybe talk about some other stuff that's come up during this. How can I factor that into my session? And I said, well, you know, the new hotness, uh, and this is a xenomorph being chased through the streets of Vancouver by bees. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. After your rousing uh, opener this morning, I got inspired to put something more about bees in here. Um, so here's a xenomorph being chased by bees. Does that look like Vancouver? Did you have OpenAI logo right there? I, I had whatever I downloaded a while ago generated. You don't think I made this by hand? <laughs> I am offended. Anyway, June 9th comes around, and I'm like, well, I should probably come up with a session for Mac DevOps. <laughs> I've already told Matt a topic, so now I've got to find something that fits that topic. Um, and uh, so, hey, let's uh, explore Nano MDM and KMF DDM locally and hosted in the cloud. I thought that would be really cool and relevant, uh, especially with Jesse being here. We're going to embarrass Jesse a little bit because a lot of this is his code. He's not even holding up his hands, but luckily, Alistair, for those of you on the live feed, everybody's giving Jesse a, a warm round of applause uh, for doing some really cool stuff for the community. Um, there you go. Yeah. If I say things, it becomes true. This is really fantastic. Um, so uh, disclaimer, we're going to be mostly focused on AWS because that's what I use. However, uh, Azure, Google, and I put this one in for you, Sam, Oracle. Uh, Oracle Cloud will probably also do all these things. I have no idea. 
Uh, but probably Google and Azure Cloud will. Uh, Oracle, I'm a little, but you know, it's free, so give it a shot. Um, and so I reached out to Jesse and I said, hey, uh, I'm gonna be doing stuff at Mac DevOps with you. And he says, oh God, don't look at that code. <laughs> So here we are looking at the code. Um, all right, so a couple of things that what we're gonna do here, if you're looking to play around with Nano MDM and KMF DDM for kind of exploring some of the declarative device management pieces, one, you should 100% do that uh, because as a Mac admin, as somebody in the industry, DDM is a train that's coming. You maybe could have ignored it a year or two ago before because it really didn't do a whole lot. You could still kind of argue sometimes it doesn't do a whole lot right now either, but is coming. And so as an admin, you're gonna have to understand this and be a little more familiar with it. So that was kind of what I wanted to do here, but it is kind of complicated to run these cloud-hosted services. How do you run them locally? Especially if you don't have a huge budget, you don't wanna spin up a bunch of containers and do all those things. So what we're gonna walk through here is what's now become my normal development process, which is to write Go in VS Studio, VS Studio is redundant, Visual Studio Code, VS Code, what do the cool kids call it? VS Code? VSC? No. No. VS Code. All right. So write it in VS Code locally, but as you may know with Apple MDM, it gets kind of complicated if you need to have a publicly hosted, you know, DNS, all the rest. So you've got to have some way of getting that out in the wild on a real IP so you can actually connect to it from your clients. And then how do you kind of manage it? How do you kind of develop through that? So we're going to walk through kind of three phases of my journey that I go through with a lot of these projects. Connectivity, storage, and then how do you make it more of a cloudy thing? All right, connectivity, certs, ports, and files. All right, so public IPs. You're gonna need one if you wanna do this because you're gonna need a publicly trusted SSL cert. All right? If you don't have a publicly trusted SSL cert, doing MDM is gonna get a lot harder. It's not necessarily impossible. Some of the other things like playing around with single sign-on extensions and things like that will become useless. Right? So get yourself a public IP address so you can put that on there. Uh, in the documentation for Nano MDM, they talk about NGROC. NGROC's a great product. It's got a free tier so you can just get a public IP address that you can connect to. Fantastic, good stuff to do. People at NGROC are great. Hi, Lee, if you're watching, uh, we should do lunch again. Um, however, I don't use NGROC, uh, I use EC2. So I go into AWS and I spin up the free micro whatever VM that they have. Uh, run Ubuntu, right? Ooh, eh, I, I don't know. I just picked the first one in the list. Um, and then I use that to host a lot of stuff. Uh, maybe it's a bit more work, but it does allow you a lot more control. Plus, I always have it there and available. Uh, NGROC on the free tier, you get, I think, for two hours or eight hours or something like that, an IP address. Uh, and then it gets recycled some. And a lot of what I do now is working with a team. And so if only I can get to it, it gets a little bit annoying. I like being able to drop links into Slack where people wake up on the other side of the world and are able to use it without me having to think about whether that's there or not. So, public IP, we're not gonna get too deep into this because this isn't the really cool stuff. Uh, CertBot for Let's Encrypt, that'll give you a free trusted SSL cert. CertBot's great. Uh, I use Nginx as a reverse proxy, which will become really interesting here in a little bit because that gets me back to my local machine, right? The goal is, I'm sure you can code remotely. I think VS Code can do that, but I don't know how to set that up. So I just use it locally. I wanna make sure I can get back, set breakpoints, and do all those things. So for that, we're actually gonna use Nebula. Nebula is a open source mesh VPN. Uh, probably a bunch of folks have been using Tailscale. Uh, Tailscale is very similar to Nebula. I like Nebula a little bit better, but uh, six and one half dozen the other. Um, with the mesh VPN, you'll be able to have a publicly addressable IP address on your EC2 instance with a trusted cert, and it just forwards back to your local machine. So Nebula runs a mesh VPN. So again, this is WireGuard is, is equivalent to Nebula. I'm sure somebody will argue about that, but cool, they're both mesh VPNs. They're both open source, good stuff. They'll get you that connectivity from your cloud hosted uh, container instance back to your uh, local laptop. That's what I'm running on here. So I've got Nebula on this machine. I've got Nebula on my Ubuntu box in AWS, and they have a fixed IP address between them, which means that I can actually go into Nginx and do a forward proxy from that public open port back down to my laptop to a local port on the laptop. 
And then it makes developing in VS Code really easy because I can set breakpoints and I can hit it from the network. All right, Lucas Hall did a session on this before he went to the big A, probably two or three years ago. Matt's gonna keep me honest um, about setting up Nebula. So if you need that, go look up that. It'll be great. Um, and then if you wanna go a little crazy, you can see my first Go program I ever wrote. Uh, it's up on GitHub. I don't think many people have found this. Uh, I don't do much on GitHub. I, I let the fox go. Uh, GitLab is cool, but I've, I don't know. Everything we do internally is on GitHub, so I just do GitHub now. I'm a lemming. Um, but you can go there. That'll help you actually set up Nebula, issue certificates, and some things like that. Um, Nginx, great uh, web service. I've never hosted web files with it. Uh, I do all that in VS Code, but I use that for the reverse proxy part of this. Um, also, you can do great things like Skep. So I'm using micro MDM SCEP server. I was gonna move to small step, but I haven't gotten around that. You often will have to have other services running. So it's really great to have that Ubuntu box that you can just put these other things up on. You don't have to worry about using them locally on your local device. Put them up there, because you're not messing around with SCEP. SCEP's a pain in the butt anyway. You don't wanna deal with that. So use something that already works, put it up there, keep it up there. And then you can use the proxy pass directive. Proxy pass looks a little bit like this, and this is the important part. So when you hit the public IP address on my Ubuntu box, you're gonna get redirected back to an internal IP, 10.10.0.50. This is the IP address of my laptop's Nebula client that's been running. And so now wherever I am, whether I'm some weird student network that the secure one is maybe as secure as the non-secure one, but I don't get offered the password as much. Um, it doesn't matter because it's always going to be phoning back home. It does great through punching through NAT and stuff like this. And so now whenever I hit that public IP address that's hosted on that Ubuntu box, it's going right back to this laptop here. I don't even think about it anymore is how great that works. So this has worked out really well. And we end up with a architecture that's a little bit like this. This was on June 12th, what I had running which was my laptop running VS Code. Look at that icon, fantastic. That's a Nebula icon, making that mesh VPN up to that AWS icon, which is the Ubuntu box. And then I tried to knock out the background on CertBot, but I don't know if I did really great about that. And then let's encrypt, so you can hit it from then any of your other systems that are out there. So some cool things there. So proof of life, uh, we can show you, got a great little video here. Um, oh, is this, this is not the, well, I guess this will work. Yeah, this will work. All right, fantastic. Um, cool. So here I am. I've got, ooh, nope. I tried to scrub through. Uh, don't, don't worry about that yet. Um, so what I've got here is a VM. Uh, I've put my enrollment profile on it. And what I'm going to show you in this video is on the right-hand side, I'm actually running nano MDM locally, right? So I'm running it on a 127.001 loopback. But since I've got it pointed through the Ubuntu box, I've got a publicly trusted SSL cert on it. So on my VM, I can just drop a, an enrollment profile that goes to that publicly hosted uh, IP, and then boom, it's gonna enroll me. There's nothing super exciting other than, like I still hate system preferences. Um, <laughs> and I still like I'm waiting for them to finish the UI. Um, but there we go, so type in my password, and you can see on the right-hand side that you're gonna get some traffic there you go, boom, there's the traffic going through that. And so now I'm running nano MDM locally. I'm able to actually set breakpoints. I'm able to actually set what's going wrong. So this is cool, but it's June 12th. Uh, we can do some more cool stuff, right? So this is when more xenomorphs come in. Um, all of my art is now done by one of the AI programs, and it's fantastic, right? I, uh, I have more art in my slides than ever before. So, cool. Nano MDM, uh, as you may have seen in that uh, Slack message I had with Jesse, has a file storage backend, which is pretty cool. Lets you get up and running pretty easily, just writes things down to the file system. Makes it really easy to troubleshoot because you can just look at the files and go, ah, <laughs> that's my problem. I got a typo. I shouldn't do that. Let me fix that. But this makes it a little harder to put things into the cloud if your storage is all local, right? So Nano MDM also has a Postgres and some SQL things. I have no idea what SQL is. It makes my head hurt every time I think about it. So instead, I have followed the serverless buzz, and I use Dynamo. Buzz, see what I did there? Yeah, I worked that in? All right, maybe some more. 
Be watching for him. Okay. All right. Here for you, Matt. All right. So uh, I use Dynamo so that I can have cloud-based storage. And then I can work off multiple laptops. I can have Nano MDM running in multiple instances. And they all feed back to the same storage backend. Um, what I like about Nano is it kind of matches a normal file system. That may sound weird until you actually get into it. Um, if you've learned SQL, you're actually at a disadvantage for using a NoSQL database. Luckily, back to the fact that I have a journalism degree, I've never learned SQL. So I came into NoSQL without any preconceptions, and it moved through pretty quickly. Um, so I like Dynamo for a couple of reasons. It's a key value database, I think, right? Document-based database. Somebody who's a DBA will yell when I say anything wrong or not. because It's a hash table. Yeah. Right. Let's go with that. Um, works really, really fast. Stupidly horizontally scalable. Something like less than 10 millisecond reads. Um, if you know what you're doing, it can be really good. If you don't know what you're doing, it can get a little weird. Uh, don't do scans, uh, just do queries. If you do scans, you're reading in all the items, and that's probably going to maybe get expensive after a while. Uh, but you do get like your first million hits free. So on the free tier at Amazon, you can do like a million calls per month to Dynamo, and you're still free. And you get 25 gigs worth of storage. What I really like about this, when I started doing some stuff with like uh, Docker and some other things, I'm running all these Postgres or SQL instances, and suddenly my AWS bill keeps coming back larger and larger, right? When I'm not using this, there's no cost unless you're accessing these. If you're only accessing at a million hits a month, there's still no cost. So it's a fantastic way to play around with doing low end or very small volume pieces. Getting into higher volume, I have no idea. All right? Again, I don't do production work, so don't even ask me about that. I think there's some sort of curve where eventually it gets more expensive than hosting everything yourself. Uh, but where that is, is probably well beyond my problems. All right? So million operations, or I said two million operations here, they, they go back and forth on their documentation. Uh, stupidly easy to integrate with Go. Um, for example, here you can load your default config it's a one-liner using the AWS SDK. And then I don't even have to know a username or password. It's just pulling it in from your AWS environmental variables. So it makes it a really, really easy way to hit the Dynamo database without having to even think about usernames, passwords, IP addresses, or anything else. Also makes it really easy to convert into a Lambda, which we'll get to in a little bit. All right, create a table. Create a table with a name, some attributes, some schema. Uh, pretty simple to do. Um, here's uh, adding an item. You just marshal it and then throw it in. Um, you've got to worry about some uh, reserved terms and stuff, but don't worry about those until things don't work. Um, in the meantime, you'll be fine. Uh, plus, you get a million hits to figure it out uh, where you go there. And here's a little example. If you're used to doing any work with JSON in Go, this is very similar. You just have whatever the things are on the right that say call it a different name whenever it gets marshaled. Right? And then it gets marshaled into these DynamoDB attributes, and you're able to store it into the database uh, really, really easily. Uh, you can see uh, I actually got all the nano MDM commands working with Dynamo really easily. So that's up there. This only took me, I gauge dev time and beers. Um, and I think this was about four beers uh, that it took to put this in here. Because again, it mostly followed the file system semantics that were already in nano MDM. But this allows you then to use an infinitely scalable database to do some cool things. Um, I also have a treatment of this with KMF DDM. Uh, maybe I'm not done with that yet, though. So don't, don't use it in production. But it does have a lot of the Dynamo pieces in there. When I'm marshalling the declarative uh, statements, it breaks. It doesn't break. It makes them, but they never take. So I got to troubleshoot that a little bit. I blame that on DDM more than I blame it on my Go skills. Um, I'm pretty confident about that. Um, so what we end up now is a situation that looks like this, where I can still run in VS Studio, VS Code on my laptop, going through Nebula to get the uh, external IP address with everything good. But now I can make a connection directly to that Dynamo DB. So now I'm storing all my records in Dynamo, all fun stuff in there. It's moving along. It's really fast. You are doing API calls to it. But I've not noticed it, especially for the low volume pieces, right? So it's, it's moving well for me here. 
Um, so a couple of tips from Dynamo. Uh, it doesn't do joins. That's the big deal between SQL and NoSQL. There are no joins. I've been told um, that Amazon, for anything they do, now they only work with Dynamo for the scalability. Right? So they don't want to have any um, SQL anymore inside because they've got to work at these massive, ginormous scales. Right? And Dynamo is able to do that because of all the stuff that it's got with it. I, I sound like a fanboy. I kind of am. Uh, I'm okay with that. Uh, it's also got cool things called global secondary indexes. And global secondary indexes allow you to kind of flip your searches. So they work out really well. I'll show you this in a little bit. All right, so let's do some Dynamo. Um, so here we are. This is Amazon's NoSQL uh, app that you can kind of run. Um, is, is it going to play? There we go. Maybe I have to click it. There we go. And you can do a search. So in this case, I hate that. I want to scrub. How do I get there? We go. We get the scrubber up. Um, and we can kind of talk through this a little bit. So I have, whenever I save a device that's coming in through Nano MDM and getting enrolled, we save it with device hash and then the, I would call it a GUID, but it's not a GUID, right? It's a UUID, UUID, do we pronounce that? No? Maybe we do now. Maybe we do now. So it's device hash mark, and I can do this for hash mark, right? Uh, UUID. Um, and that makes a real nice and easy call. And then you can actually see all of the information. So I'm just going to do a quick run. You can see how fast that is. And I'm using this with a live cloud table. So again, I'm running this app locally, but it's querying my Amazon instance. And then this replicates the file structure that if you're running Nano MDM by itself with the file back end, that's the exact same file structure. You'll have files with individual bits of data on each one perfect, we follow the exact same thing here, right? Cool stuff, makes it easy to integrate back with the nano MDM code, because I don't even have to think about what I'm looking up, and we can just ask for a device with a UD and the identity PEM, and then we'll have it right there. Um, Dynamo is schema-less, which means you don't really even have to think about it before you start developing, right? If, if you really want to do like Postgres well, you got to sit down, you got to like, okay, crap. What am I going to store in it? What is it going to look like? Where am I going to put it? And then if you mess up and you figure out later you did it wrong, you either got to throw everything out or you got to do a migration or something, right? And that doesn't sound good at all. So with Dynamo, since it's schemaless, ah, I just add a new field. I store information differently. Who cares? It just overwrites what's already in there when I touch it and we move on. So it's a really, really nice way of doing that. Uh, and you can see you can store a whole bunch of stuff. There's some sort of limit, like one meg per record. Um, I, I so far haven't even come close to that. If you do, go use S3 to go store it. Um, so here I am going to then do a lookup. I've got the device. Now I'm going to move over to uh, KMF DDM. And here's an enrollment with all the status of all the declarations. You can see i got a couple errors in there. Um, all the status type, status IDs, and everything else that are in there. So it makes it really, really easy to store all this. You can also do a reverse. So this is a, I set up a secondary global index, which then reverses the uh, partition key and the sort key. So then it's very easy to look up, show me all of the devices that have this default set that they've been enrolled in declarative device management. Um, and again, pretty quick to respond. Um, and I, um, I, like I said, I've just been quite pleased with how easy it is to run through this. Um, I don't show it in here, but you can also do some um, sorts by uh, begins with. So you've got options more than just having them directly match the actual data that you know. You can do some queries on that. So it's an easy way then to do some good work there. So all right. Now, so we've got it running locally. We've got it using cloud storage, which is really cool. So then we're not filling up our local system with all those files. But now, you know, sometimes I'm on a plane. Right? Uh, my laptop's not always running, so when I you know, tell my wife, hey, go enroll your machine, uh, I want to make sure that my declarative device management system is fully up and running um, with the help of some Xenomorph friends. This is, uh, I think I also gave it Vancouver in the uh, prompt. Uh, I know, I think it came out well. <laughs> uh, Vancouver known for its palm trees, uh, absolutely. Uh, for those of you on the live stream, the audience is laughing uh, very loudly. Um, 
You do have palm trees. Where? Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad the memes are already going well in the, uh, in the channel there. All right. So uh, a couple of ways you can cloudify things, right? You can run it as a service. This is probably what some of you have already done. Uh, if you're running um, nano MVM right now, you're kind of running it as a service in some sort of cloud system. Perfect, right? It's great. Keep doing that if you like it. Fantastic. Uh, you can do some things with K8S. Um, I'm not entirely certain what that is, but uh, I think we've had some talks on that before. Um, right? I, it's cool. Kates. Kates. Do, do you call it Kates? Or do you always say Kubernetes? No, like, you know, oh. <laughs> All right. K8S it is. All right. What I've been having fun with are lambdas. And I know, again, this is going to make me sound like a serverless fan. Uh, and, and maybe I am. Uh, but lambdas have been actually pretty cool to put together and make it really easy to put some of this code online. So lambdas, Go is a fully supported uh, language within it. It's probably much easier to set up than you think. Um, maybe one beer. Um, and it's a one-line change. If you've been writing web services using net, HTTP, and Go, it's literally a one-line change to turn that same service into a Lambda. You can then compile the Go code, put it into uh, Amazon, and Azure has functions, Google Cloud has functions too, that are the same as Lambdas? Sure. Does Oracle have functions, Sam? Somebody in the, in the Discord channel can figure out if Oracle has functions. Uh, and you get a million invocations on the free tier. So again, you're still in free land here, and you're able to do quite a bit of work in your Lambda without actually running up a bill yet. So where you might have had this, this is straight out of Nano MDM. You've got a listen and serve, and then you put your MUX in there. What does MUX stand for? Multiplexer. Eh, I thought it was more exciting than that. Uh, okay, so you, you load your MUX into your listen and serve. To do this with a Lambda, uh, all you're doing is Lambda start, and then you give it your MUX. Um, really easy to do that, and then your Lambda is able to serve those same records and everything else. Uh, beautiful thing about that, similar to Dynamo, if you're not using it, it's not costing any money. You don't have to run that resource. So that Windows MDM that I put together about two to three months ago, it's running as a Lambda with Dynamo for its storage. I haven't touched it in a month or two because once I figured out how it works, I didn't really care after that. Um, and so I haven't been running up the bill on an EC2 instance or an RDS instance or something else like that just to have it there on the off chance that somebody asks me a question about what is Windows MDM like, right? And if I need it, I can just hit the same endpoints and away we go. Uh, so you can see this Lambda. I put one into the Nano MDM code. Um, the style that I've been using, which I have no idea if it's good or not, where you go into command and you have different folders for different commands. I have a Lambda version of the service. And that way, all the Lambda and AWS things are nice and separate from everything else that's in there. So you'll see that in the code that's on the repo today. Uh, to build it, you use Goose Linux, GoArc, AMD64, Go Build. Uh, and then you'll build your binary. Um, I mean, this is one of the great things about Go is the cross-platform compatibility is fantastic. All right? So you can build this on your Mac. Um, the Lambdas are all run on Linux, whatever Amazon Linux thing that they use. Um, so you build it there. You just upload it. Boom. You're off to the races. I'll show you that here. So here's my Nano MDM Lambda that's running up there. Uh, it's front-ended by API Gateway, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, Upload it just as a zip file. Pretty easy to do. Even I can do that. Uh, you get a little picker. You pick the zip file. You hit OK. Gets uploaded. Uh, it says for files larger than 10 megs, but I've not had a. It says consider uploading. Uh, don't worry about that. Um, <laughs> the only thing you really care about in the code properties is to make sure you change your handler. This like gets me every time because they've got some stupidly named like hello handler that it defaults to. And you're never going to write code. Well, Anybody write code with a hello handler? Yeah, you're never going to do that. So you're always going to get stuck by this. Change it back to main. And then it's going to be invoking everything that the way you want it to. Um, if you add the Dynamo permissions into your IAM role, 
um, you then get all the Dynamo access without having to specify anything. Uh, your AWS config will be automatically fed to your Lambda, and then it'll automatically figure out what it needs to do. If it can't reach Dynamo, you'll get some nice error messages that you'll have no idea what they mean. But I'm telling you, if you get error messages, it's probably your IAM permissions. So go through that. Uh, make sure you set the handler function. And then a lot of times I expose a health endpoint just for basic sanity checking. Uh, it is a little bit more complicated to understand if your Lambda is running because you don't have a full OS to actually look at. You can't look at a proc table. You can't look at a socket file to see if something's in there. Instead, you have to kind of poke it yourself. Uh, so I usually put a health endpoint in there just to make sure. Uh, you may want to use that anyway. Um, for the DNS, or actually the SSL side, uh, I use API Gateway. Again, I really sounded like a fanboy. Um, and that's, that's really not my intent here. Uh, so I'm hoping for somebody from Oracle gives me a very large Oracle package uh, so I can try out the Oracle systems that do this. Uh, but it has been really nice to put this together. Um, on the API gateway, you get a proxy handler, and it'll also handle all your TLS. So uh, even do MTLS, because you can put authorizers on the API gateway. So if you don't even want NanoMDM to think about it, I believe NanoMDM has the ability to take a cert in a header. Jesse's going to nod yes, yeah. So this will actually do all that for you. If you want to do all the MTLS at that level, it'll be able to do that with an authorizer, pass it through, and then NanoMDM doesn't even have to worry about that. Um, in API Gateway, this is the magic. It's a greedy proxy, I believe is what it's called, and it just forwards everything to your Lambda function. So you don't even have to think about what endpoints you have. Don't even, don't, don't even worry about that. Just put it all through to this greedy proxy. Greedy proxy will forward everything to your Lambda. Your Lambda will spin up, respond, go there. This is kind of what it looks like here, but this is all like built by it when you just associate the Lambda uh, with the API gateway. Here's authorizers. Uh, I often use an authorizer to do OpenID Connect uh, OAuth uh, authentication. Uh, so I'll actually handle that at the API gateway, and then only the requests that are already authorized will come through. Um, API Gateway also has some cool ways of pipelining requests, lightly transforming them, and then hitting uh, AWS resources directly. So it's entirely conceivable that you could have a no Lambda, no code solution to be able to actually access Dynamo, right? So I have done that in some cases. Can be handy a lot uh, with push notifications and things like that. Um, domain details is just some more stuff for the API Gateway. Uh, API Gateway tips. Uh, add your Dynamo table to the AM role in Lambda. Oh, no, um, I didn't actually edit this slide. Uh, this is the same slide as from before, so ignore this slide. Uh, API gateway tips, just do what my uh, little screenshot show you, and you'll be fine. All right, so now you end up with a great network map like this, where you've got two kind of entry points in to the exact same code. So you're running Nano MDM here on your Mac in VS Code, you're running that exact same binary, minus the fact that it was compiled for Linux as opposed to the Mac. As a Lambda up in the cloud, you've got an API gateway that's handling the SSL termination and all the other stuff that you need. And they're both using the same database. I also do a lot of testing this way, where I can release a version up as a Lambda. Other people in the team can start playing with it. They can start hitting it and using it. Meanwhile, I'm actually running a newer version of whatever we're working on locally, but I'm using the same database at the same time. So I don't have to worry about re-enrolling a bunch of machines. I've got the same push certificates that are up there. Um, Dynamo's pretty happy with this. All the writes are atomic, so maybe you get the wrong information because your sequence of writes is maybe off, but you'll never get broken information. So you can feel pretty good about hitting it from multiple places. Um, and it makes it an easy way to pick up development. So this is where we were, what is it, the 21st today? All right, so this is where it was on the 19th. All right, so some pretty cool stuff. Got all this working. Again, the code's up on the repo, and I got a little bit of a video. I mean, you gotta make Lambda jokes, right? Um, and so here, and this is kind of fun, and I should probably explain this. All right, uh, if you go back to that network slide I had before, there is a local, version of Nano MDM running in VS Code. There is a cloud version of Nano MDM running as a Lambda. They're both hitting the same database. So some cool things that you can do here. 
What I'm doing here is I'm using the second profile. You probably didn't notice this, but there's two profiles there. I'm using the second profile here, and I'm going to enroll this into the Lambda. And I'll actually play this live so you can see. It's, uh, it's fast. If I hit enroll, uh, type in my name, um, password, there you go. You wait the second or two. The Lambda wakes up, responds to it. The uh, SCEP profile comes down, and now we're enrolled. So even though the Lambda is not persistent, um, the startup time, they've done a lot of work, I guess, to make that really fast. So for most cases, for most uses, you're not going to notice it, especially for proof of concept work and things like that. So now I'm enrolled in the Lambda, but sitting on the right hand of the screen is my actual locally running version of Nano MDM. All right? So now I'm going to go to the command line on my Mac, and I'm actually going to push a profile to this machine. So here's a nano MDM command running through one of the Python tools that's part of it. And I'm going to push a new profile that I have that installs a single sign-on extension. Right? I'm hitting 127.001. That's nano MDM running on my local machine. But since it's using the same database as the cloud version, the local one's going to write that profile into Dynamo. It's then going to pull the push certificate out of Dynamo and notify my device to go phone home. My VM is then going to phone home through the Lambda, pick up the same profile that got put there, because they're both using the same data storage. So that maybe helps, because it's not visually that exciting. You just see a line of red. All right? So this is going to happen. I push it to the local instance. The VM phones home. And when I switch back to my VM, when I find it down there in my dock, there it is. Now you're going to see that I've got that SSOE profile that's been pushed to that device. So you can have some really cool development processes here, because again, all of your devices can be phoning back home to this main system, but you can be tweaking it locally. You can be saving things into that database, and it all just kind of comes together. Again, do you use this in production? Probably not, but hey, that's, uh, you know, uh, but wait, oh, there's more stuff, right? This is what I really actually wanted to do. Uh, it was unfortunate that it took me a couple of days to get the other stuff up. Um, but I was going to have a cool whole session on this. Um, so there's more. And like, keep it micro, man, right? The cool thing about Nano MDM, it was designed to do one very little limited functionality. And so to add in some of the dance dance management pieces, you have a whole separate binary to put that in together. There's a command piece that's also separate. So I wanted to keep these pieces into microservices. And a really easy way for me to do that is I could create an admin interface into Nano and uh, KMF DDM without actually having to alter those systems. Since all the information is back in Dynamo, I can write a service that just reads and writes directly out of Dynamo which means it's very easy for me to turn this into something that looks a little bit like this, where I can hit the admin interface from my phone. I don't write HTML, um, so I just write it all in Swift UI. Uh, this session wasn't about Swift, so we're not going to talk too much about that. But it's really cool, really easy to write some nice interfaces. The, P, uh, the Macs are still going to hit uh, through the Lambda for all the enrollment stuff and things. But I'm going to hit an admin interface Again, going through a different Lambda, but back to the same database. And I could do that here. Uh, so this is a little app. And this is what I finished this morning. Eh, finished, but got working enough that we can use this. So an app on the phone, you can do some authentication. Uh, we're just going to go through an OpenID Connect flow, get some tokens. Boom. Now we're actually, well, ah. I like doing my demos live, so, uh, but we only had the one machine, so I, I put them here. <laughs> All right, uh, so once I authenticate, and we'll do this in real time so you can kind of see it, I'm hitting the Lambda, and I'm able to actually get a list of all my devices. I can look at each one, click on them, and then I can actually find out what declarative device management has been set up on it. And this is because, again, all of the files are stored back in that Dynamo database, so I can hit them all individually. And I got a little flip switch up here. So I can flip between local versions and the cloud versions. So that way I can test against a new version, make sure everything's working. I can then compile that, ship that up to a Lambda, flip back over to the cloud version, and get the same results. So I think it makes for a pretty easy development pattern to be able to work through those flows uh, and not get caught up. 
And with that, I think I've overstayed my welcome by a little bit, uh, but Matt hasn't sent me off. So thank you very much.